So cochlear implants are different from hearing aids. Remember hearing aids amplify sound. Cochlear implants are surgically exerted by medical devices to provide, provide sound information. They compensate for damaged or non-working parts of the inner ear. So they basically skip the cochlea. So most of these children that have you know profound hearing loss have um, issues with their outer hair cells. So connects in the genetic disorder, it has to do with the outer hair cells, you know, not growing or being damaged or destroyed. The cochlear implant skips the outer hair cells and it's inserted into the cochlea and it directly stimulates the auditory nerve. So it's, the sound is different from our typical hearing, but when used properly and programmed properly, a child can develop spoken language. It's amazing what they, it's amazing, it's amazing that these things work. Even the surgeons and the engineers that first developed these devices like 20 years ago were impressed that how amazing our brain is that it can take these electrically coded signals and create meaning of them and the child can develop spoken language. So the main components are the surgically implanted electrode array and the external speech processor, which is now like, it looks like a behind the ear hearing aid. It used to be bigger and bulkier, but as technology gets better, it gets smaller and smaller. So the microphone and speech processor picks up the sound and transmits it into the speech processor where it gets coded. It gets coded by frequency and then it's sent via an FM wave through the skin of the ear into the internal parts, the internal components, including the internal electrical array, which is inserted in the cochlea. And the internal electrical array directly stimulates the auditory nerve and a signal is sent to the brain. So you see the, um, the speech processor is worn in the ear. There's a microphone, picks up the sound. The speech is coded, transmitted across the skin to the receiver stimulator, and it's that electrode array. The electrode array is like beaded, so there are t like channels, usually around 22 channels, and each channel directly stimulates a group of frequencies for the auditory nerve. So, you know, there's channel for, I'm making this up, I don't know off the top of my head. Let's say there's a channel for 1,000 to 2,000 hertz, and then there's a channel for 2,001 hertz to 4,000 hertz. So, there, um, it's very gross, a gross electronic response as opposed to our outer hair cells which are very fine processing where we have hair cells for every frequency that we hear this cochlear implant is much grosser but it works and like they said it's amazing that it works and the processor it's programmed specifically for the child there are different um, settings that can be made like again with quiet or, or noisy and as the technology improves and the outcome data becomes more available, like we know children with cochlear implants 10,000 times outperform kids with hearing aids. And I'm over-exaggerating, but we know there's a much greater benefit with cochlear implants. The criteria for a cochlear implant candidacy is changing. It's becoming more liberal, where now you don't have to have a profound hearing loss and um, you don't have to have... Um, like we're doing bilateral implants and in, instead of being implanted at 18 months, infants are now getting implanted at 12 months. So the general trends, children are being implanted at increasingly younger ages and with more residual hearing, so with less profound hearing loss. And data continues to show that the younger the child is when they're implanted, the better the desired outcomes. So what's most important at this point is not necessarily the severity of the hearing loss, but the duration of deafness. So a child that's only deaf for 12 months is going to more, you know, learn language faster than a child that's been uh, deaf for 18 months. So the generally accepted criteria is 12 months of age or older, even though younger kids are being implanted. The issue with implanting younger children is anesthesia. Sometimes, you know, parents are reluctant to put the child under an infant under when they're very young. Uh, severe to profound bilateral sensorineural hearing loss, you have to have an auditory nerve. This is like the catch. So if there's no auditory nerve, this cochlear implant won't, won't work. Or if there is an auditory, there is no, there is an auditory nerve implant, but it's not nearly effective.
like a cochlear implant. So you have to have an intact auditory nerve with limited benefit of hearing loss. And there's always a trial with hearing aids because we're not gonna let any time waste. There should be no medical contradictions to undergo surgery. It's an outpatient surgery. It takes two or three hours. So the child doesn't even have to stay overnight. They should have no middle ear disease. And you wanna have a really strong educational setting that emphasize auditory therapy and communication and a highly motivated family with realistic expectations. Unfortunately, there are schools for deaf children that are filled all over our area um, with kids that have cochlear implants that haven't achieved success. So there is no guarantee with a cochlear implant. It really takes a lot of effort on the part of the parents and the teachers um, to get a child to speak. You know, I know someone that works at the New York School for the Deaf, and she said that a lot of her children at the school, um, their parents are immigrants and they're working, you know, two or three jobs all the time. English isn't their first language. And, um, you know, they don't necessarily understand the repercussions of hearing loss or how cochlear implants work. And oftentimes, you know, the kids will come to school with no implant or with broken implants or implants with dead batteries. So it's, it's, and that's not going to work. Like it has, you have to have your implant working and functioning on all hours of the day and you just need intensive attention from caregivers and teachers. Um, so, you know, it's not a quick, not a quick fix. It used to be that you had to have unaided thresholds, 70 to 90 dB. Um, but like I said, they're um, loosening up the criteria. We're now Children with moderate hearing losses are also getting their cochlear implants. <clears throat> the less time a child is deaf, the better they end up doing. A cochlear implant is always a tool. It's only a tool. It's, it takes a lot of work, and the key variable is age. So the younger, the better, when the brain is more plastic. Uh, traditionally, children were only getting unilateral cochlear implantation, and the idea was, oh, like save the other ear in case something better comes along or if the cochlear implant doesn't work, save one ear. But, you know, study after study has shown that bilateral implantation improves speech recognition and noise because you get binaural squelch, localization, binaural summation. Um, bilateral implantation is the way to go. So now you'll see it much more common than before. There are substantial benefits. And even children that um, got one implant when they were a year old and another when they were six years old still receive a benefit. But in general, you want to get um, two implants at the same time. There's also bimodal fitting where a child will wear a cochlear implant in one ear and the hearing aid in the other ear. Cochlear implants work with FM systems just like hearing aids do. They get that boot that clips right on and it improves the signal and noise ratio. Remember, all kids improve, all kids benefit from that signal to noise ratio improvement.